The Word of God from Ephesians chapter 3. And while you're turning there, welcome, children of God, welcome. It is so good to worship God with you, to be in the presence of God together. I want you to know that you are a child of God, someone that God has made, someone that God loves, and someone that God wants to dwell in. So thank you. Thank you for joining us in person and online. And now, the word of the Lord from Ephesians chapter 1. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Wait, wait, wait a second. Everybody just sit down. Let's stop right there. Everyone take a seat. A prisoner? I know it feels a little like deja vu, right? Sometimes Paul's word just takes us back. Is that what this Christianity thing is all about? Becoming a prisoner? I've been a minister for over three decades. I've been a Christian my entire life, and I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, oh, Christianity, why, why do you believe in Christ? Why do, you, why do you go to church? Why are you a part of this? And I, and I think a lot of these questions come because people see Christianity is something of its own prison sentence. They think, oh, why would you bother? Why would you be locked up in that way of thinking? And, and I think what happens is, is that a lot of pe times people judge Christianity by the flaws that they see in Christians. And I don't know that that's very fair. Because as imperfect as we are, we're not the selling point of Christianity. This is about Jesus Christ and lifting up Jesus Christ. I mean, it's almost like people can easily just flip up the hood and look under and see all the oil and the grease and detached cables and think, eh, this is just, I don't, I don't like the running of this car. Or they look at the smoke billowing out the back and they think, I, I, I just don't want anything. And they just see all of the negatives, the oil spot under the car, and they miss the purpose of what this is all about. And it happens quite frequently. And so when I answer that, I say, well, just close the hood, get in the car and drive. Take this trip. If you look at it and you compare alternatives to Christianity, I just can't find any that stack up to the beauty and the glory of the message that's offered in Jesus Christ, the life of God that's offered to us. And a passage like we have today is one of those places that tell us of the beauty of what God has done in Christ. That, that helps us move past the purpose of Christianity just being going to church or being nice or being of a certain kind of person. No, no, no. The purpose of Christ and the purpose of Christianity is to gather up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. And so I think we need to try again. Let, let's stand up again. Let's try this and see. It's more than Paul being in prison. Let's listen. And listen for the mystery. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you've already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given to me for you. How the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I wrote about in a few words, a reading of which you will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, the mystery was not made known to humankind as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, sharers in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I've become a servant, according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I'm the very least of all the saints, this Grace was given me to bring the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery for ages in God who created all things so that through the church and the wisdom of God in its rich variety might be now made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the purpose of that he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God through faith in him. I pray, therefore, 
that you will not lose heart over my sufferings, for they are for your glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can find your seats. This man was given a mystery. And it's not a mystery in the typical sense of mysteries. He didn't own it. It wasn't his secret. He didn't create it at all. It's a message that for Paul was intertwined with his very being. A message that had him captured, bound up, imprisoned. And it was a message of inclusion. A message of God reaching out through the Jews, to all peoples, to all nations. And Paul tells us, I am in prison because of Jesus Christ for your sake. And it's not the kind of job you want to be given. This is not something that you get signed up for. It's not an appealing job description. Paul says, God commissioned me to this message, to unveil it, to let it out. And the secret that he has is, is it's kind of like pulling the sheet off of something that's been hidden. It's declassified. If you're into computers, this is open source code that you can use. It is a mystery that's for everyone. And Paul sees himself as something of a social influencer, someone who's putting out this message in as many different directions as he can. He's shining a spotlight, verse 9, on this good news message of inviting people in to know who Christ is. And he tries to lay out some other credentials. Credentials like being a servant. It's not a very appealing credential. If someone tells you, yeah, I'm a a servant at Burger King, do you think they're very high-ranking? You think they're a manager? You think they're a CEO? Probably not. They may feel lower on the totem pole. And Paul says, I'm a servant, or even lower, I'm the least. This guy, who had every credential that he would need to succeed in life, says, I'm the least, I'm a servant. Clearly, it's not about the messenger. It's not about who Paul is at all. It's about the message. And this mystery is one that he wants everyone to perceive, everyone to see. People that have never heard about God. People that have heard about God for their entire life. And that message shows up in verse 6. That's where I want to spend a bit of time today, is in verse 6, where he gives three descriptions for how outsiders have become insiders. A message of inclusion and embracing of people that are on the outside with God. A message that if we tune into many preachers or tune into famous uh, churches, we may not hear that this message is intended for everyone. Because sometimes we think of it as an exclusive message, a VIP entrance only kind of message, that it's just for those holy ones on the inside. But in verse 6, it says that they are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise. The nations, the people who aren't Jews, the people who don't think of themselves as religious people are now fellow heirs. I don't know how many of you have inherited anything, maybe a a possession, maybe something with monetary value. And when, when wills get settled, sometimes it can be a mess. Thankfully in my family, it's not a mess. Things are really straightforward. But It's difficult because people start wanting their part or their share. A comparison that I think of is the the United States government has given Native American populations the ability to, to open up casinos. And so tribes will open up a casino and it's all the the proceeds are shared with that tribe. And you may not know this, but sometimes the questions are raised about whether or not you're actually a member of that tribe. And the game has been to kind of exclude as many people as possible to get them out. And and why would you want fewer people in? Well, your share goes up. Your profits increase. There's kind of a common thing where whenever you're splitting things, even in the kingdom of God, you think, I want my share. And insiders think their share should be more. But Paul says, no, in Christ, the Gentiles, the nations have an equal share. They're offered the same thing in Christ Jesus. 
That's one image. The other one is of a same body. Same body. So your, your hand is attached to your body, your nose, your foot is attached to your body. Okay, we Christians have heard of these images, but honestly, it's kind of a weird image for me to say, yes, my hand is a part of my body. Well, duh. I mean, your body is connected. It is what it is. In fact, this word, same body, is only in Christian literature. It's not something that's used outside of Christian literature. It's almost like this redundancy thing where insiders have to be told, yes, we are connected to, we are one with those who are on the outside. Being made together into Christ. Well, the third one, in addition to being of the same body and having being fellow heirs, is sharing in the promise that insiders and outsiders both share in the commitments that God has made. And that means a lot for Paul. Because Paul was one who, as a Jew, was willing to kill and persecute those who were not Jews. Those who were believers in Christ. Until he confronts Jesus on the road. And suddenly becomes flipped. Becomes a follower of Jesus. Who includes Jews and Gentiles and all peoples into this message. Communicating to them God's adoption program. Did you know that? I mean, it was it mentioned in verse 5 of chapter 1 that in Christ we are destined for adoption into this group of people. So we share money. We share flesh. We share the commitments that God has made to all people. And that is a good news message that's worth sharing. Well, I guess the next obvious thing is to ask, well, well who are these outsiders? Who are the ones that we are to be approaching? The ones that are outsiders to us or outsiders from us. And and I have to be honest for myself, and so I'll share with you kind of more characteristics that for me make someone feel like an outsider. And, And one of them is just whenever people don't follow the rules, whenever they're unlawful, it's frustrating. It's like, can't we all follow the basic rules And so I kind of see sometimes a lawbreaker as an outsider. I don't know if you feel that way or not. I I, I sometimes feel this way about people that insult or are mean. They look at someone who's younger or older or different in some way, and they're just insulting. Maybe they're not smart enough or they're too smart. And so they get made fun of and dug at. Or maybe for me, since I'm one that's been following God, it's difficult for me when people despise God, when they just want to turn away from God and blame God for everything, and I just want them to see the beauty of what God is doing in the world. When people are greedy or selfish, when they're motivated only by their own interests, it's troubling to me. Now, my list could go on and on. I don't know about you, about who would function as an outsider. You would have all kinds of people on this list So I want to take it a step further and make this a little bit more fresh and maybe a little more challenging. Because if the good news is our currency, if we're to offer what's called good news, then here's something I want us to think about. If the gospel is not good news for everyone, then it's not good news. I mean, really let that simmer. If the gospel is not good news for everyone, it's not good news. Sometimes we're committed to making this news bad with some of our questions. If you died tonight, do you know where you would go? We try to scare people. We make it bad news. Or we try to hold up a mirror and point out all of their flaws, all of their mistakes. We try to convince them that they're sinners and that they're on the outside. That somehow that is what the good news is all about. When the aim is about coming into Christ. Becoming more and more like Christ. And yet we make it such bad news. It's true. That we are all made in the image of Christ. It's true that we are loved by God. It's true that God wants to dwell in us. And when God comes and dwells in us, 
We can't just stay as we are. We're transformed. We're changed. It's not that we become different people, but we begin to see the world in a different way. Where this God project of what God's doing to include everyone in heaven and on earth, bringing them together, that God project becomes something of a God process in us, where we're transformed. Or we must think about what this good news looks like in the lives of other people. People who, before they're even aware of what God wants to do in their life, are drawn in. In the wisdom of God, the church has been a gathering place for these kind of folks. Gathering place for all people. Paul talks about it in verse 10 as a place where the manifold wisdom of God in all of its variety is seen. That we're not about uniformity and sameness, but there's difference. And receiving this God project transforms us in some ways. Because the God project is not like finding a, a lamp, a genie lamp bottle that we can then ask for whatever we want. It's not about being handed the winning lotto ticket where all of our uh, bills are paid and everything's grand. It's, it's not that kind of a project. That invites us into something different where we are invited into the church Church today, when we use the word, is kind of a religious word. When Paul wrote it down in this letter, it just meant gathering. Like a civic gathering. The ecclesia. Like the mission that we've said over and over again that he writes in this letter, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, that God's plan is to gather up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. It's not about hierarchy or rank. In the church office back there, we don't have a list of the wealthiest to the poorest. We don't have a list of the most sinless to the most sinful. There's no list of the most gifted or those that lack gifts. There's no ranking. We come into this gathering on the same floor, the same group of people, caught up in Christ Jesus as Lord. And so this God project is not a, a genie. It's not a lotto ticket. It invites us into this path that Paul has taken where in order to preach this message of inclusion, we suffer to the degree that we give it away, where God offers love to all. And we have to know that because we serve a Savior who lived and died, that our life, our sins brought Jesus to death, we have to know that if we're following that Jesus, we're going to be in the same place, needing to die to things in our life, being willing to die for the sake of other people. I think sometimes today we're a little bit too sensitive and maybe not sensitive enough. I don't know if you feel this. Were there words that you have to be careful for? And there's a lot of sensitivities. Everyone's feelings is right at the top of their skin. And, and I feel like in some ways we are too sensitive. Maybe we have this high sensitivity for those that we love and those that are immediately around us. And we're very sensitive and protective of them. And a very low sensitivity towards those who are not a part of that group. They're outside of our love. They're maybe a little bit more different from us where we can't quite make sense of who they are. And we have this approach where we want to lock up those that we disagree with. We want to hide them away in another place in another time, to not have to see them and not be around them. When this journey of Christianity is a journey of being willing to die for those with whom we disagree. I mean, that's exactly what Paul did. He shows us an image of Christ and an image of Christianity where it's not about vengeance. He played that game. He tried that. And Jesus showed him a different way. It's not vengeance. It's about willingness to suffer for others. Did you notice that's how this ended? And it's the same way it began? Paul says, don't worry about my sufferings. They're for you. I am in prison because of this message of inclusion that I am preaching on your behalf. I'm a prisoner because of Christ and this message. Well, I still want to know what this looks like. 
Because in the same way that Christianity can sometimes lose its purpose, where sometimes people think that Christians are the perfect imitation and emulation of Christianity, and they judge it by us, other things can lose their purpose as well. So what about this? What if Christians were able to help groups discover their own purpose? Because they lose their purpose. So I'm thinking about schools and neighborhoods and workplaces. You know, sometimes schools lose the purpose of helping kids find a love of learning. And they get caught up in teacher salaries, or they get caught up in evaluation of how many kids are in the class, or test scores, and they forget about helping students find a love of learning. Or what about neighborhoods? When neighborhoods just become, how many apartments can we cram into this building? How many people can we get in there to raise our profitability? How many lots can we squeeze onto this neighborhood to get as many houses to increase our profitability? Sometimes we lose the purpose and we cut corners because that purpose has been lost. It seems like a Christian approach would be approaching those places and saying, how can we help you provide a safe neighborhood for people that live here? How can we help people know that it's peaceful, that they can eat with their families, they can play outside and it be safe? How can we help schools further that purpose of helping children love learning? For that matter, what about medical facilities where sometimes it just feels like we're cattle being pushed through to increase the profits of the facility, to really care about that patient and their well-being and what happens to them. And if those examples are too far removed from you, think about yourself, your clients, your students, your patients, the people that are your suppliers. How is it that they see the good news in you? Because if the good news is not good news for everyone, it's not good news. And people will exclude themselves from this message because they don't think that they belong. What if Christians were able to really show this good news? To be willing to partner with others so that others can embrace this mission that is what we're about, of seeing all things gathered up in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. It brings some challenging questions for us about whether we're willing to be like Jesus or be like Paul, being willing to be jailed, not because of something that we've done for ourselves, but because of this message that we've proclaimed that invites all into the kingdom of heaven. How is it that we can show the world what this good news is? I think, I think if we took that course, people would not see the flaws of Christians, they wouldn't see the inadequacies of Christianity. They would see its aim of becoming like Christ, of modeling in our bodies what it is to care about this world and the people in it, and to, like God, draw them closer to the one who lives in them, the one who loves them dearly, and the one that has made them in all their beauty. I really believe that there is no better alternative message than what Christianity has to offer. This life in Christ is jaw-dropping. It is equally challenging. And I invite us to think and meditate this week on how the good news can be good news for everyone. Not just good news for me, but good news for everyone. Let's pray. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, gatherer of all your creation. We ask that you will, you'll gather up our thoughts, you'll gather up our actions, our mistakes, our gifts, who we are. Will you gather us all together into a people who in some small way manifest the rich diversity of your wisdom. We thank you for the wisdom of, of showing us who you are through Jesus, a Savior who was willing to, to live and teach and, and not just talk, but who suffered 
with governmental authorities, religious authorities, and social authorities, laid down his life to show the kind of love that you have. God, would you fill us with your fullness? Would you fill us with this love? And we ask this through the powerful name of Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and for all times. Amen.